You are listening to Spider-Man, a story based on a film treatment by Sterling Siliphant, adapted by Tim Maxwell. In Boca Raton, Florida, the air was thick with anticipation in a hotel ballroom. Gary Holt Williams, a presidential candidate, stood with his staff facing the glaring network microphones. Williams, a man in his late 50s with a steely demeanor, bore the unmistakable mark of his military career. As a former chief of naval operations and the nation's most distinguished wartime admiral, his presence commanded respect. Yet, tonight, he stood as the most soundly defeated political candidate in the nation's history. The room was heavy with the weight of the moment. Williams was about to deliver his concession speech to the nation, a task that cut deeply into his pride. His platform for America had failed, and now he had to acknowledge that defeat publicly. His advisory group standing close by mirrored his indignation, their faces taut with frustration. Thank you all for being here tonight. As I stand before you, I must concede victory to my opponent, the incumbent president. This is not the outcome we hoped for, and it is a rebuff from the American people that we must accept. The unprecedented nature of this defeat. No major party candidate has ever attracted so few votes speaks volumes. We fought hard. We believed in our vision for America, and yet the results are clear. Despite this setback, I refuse to say goodbye to America. This defeat, as significant as it is, does not mark the end of our journey. My commitment to the interests of this great nation remains unwavering, far more significant than any personal defeat. I promise you this. I will return. Our mission to better this country is not over. We will continue to fight for what is right, for what is just, and for the future we all deserve. Thank you and good night. Hey, my name is Peter Parker, and uh, well, this is a crazy story, but why don't I just go back to the beginning? Starting college as a freshman was a whole new adventure for me. Campus was alive with activity. Classes, sports, fraternities, and so many new faces. It was a lot to handle. And to top it off, I had Aunt May and Uncle Ben constantly worrying about me. But there was one thing I could always count on. My studies, especially science. One morning, I was in the science lab, my sanctuary. The smell of chemicals and the gentle clink of glassware always helped me focus. I was working near an atomic pile, completely engrossed in my experiments, when a spider, shimmering with radioactive energy, crawled through the lab. Before I knew it, it bit me on the arm. Barely hurt and I quickly brushed it off, not thinking much of it. But later that day, on my way home, I was about to cross an intersection when a car came speeding around the corner. The driver didn't see me, and I should have been hit. But in that split second, my senses went into overdrive. I saw the car, felt a surge of agility, and leapt out of the way. Next thing I knew, I was 50 feet in the air, clinging to the side of a building, four stories up. In the days that followed, I noticed other changes. My senses were off the charts. I could hear everything, even from blocks away. My strength skyrocketed to unbelievable levels. I started running secret tests to understand what was happening. 
I lifted heavy objects like they were nothing, jumped incredible distances, and clung to surfaces effortlessly. It didn't take long to figure out that the spider bite was the cause of all this. That tiny creature had given me spider sense, spider strength, and the ability to climb walls and leap through the air. I thought a lot about what these new powers meant. The idea of using them for personal gain, maybe even becoming famous, was tempting. But deep down, I knew better. I couldn't use these gifts selfishly. I had to help others, be a force for good. So I embraced my destiny. I was no longer just Peter Parker, the college student who excelled in science and dealt with overprotective guardians. Now, now I was something more, something extraordinary. And I was ready to face whatever came next. Admiral Gary Holt Williams, aboard his sleek, converted Navy Corvette, cut through the waves with an air of purpose. The sun had begun its descent, casting a golden hue across the expansive ocean. A select group of men, each wealthy and influential, gathered in the yacht's luxurious cabin. These were the power brokers of the military-industrial complex, the shadowy architects of national policy and defense. Williams, a man whose steely resolve had been forged through decades of military service, stood at the head of the table. His eyes, sharp and intense, swept across the faces of his guests. Each man in the room understood the gravity of the situation. America had turned its back on the Admiral's vision, rejecting his platform in a crushing electoral defeat. But Williams was not a man to be easily deterred. His voice, steady and commanding, filled the room as he outlined his belief. Tonight, I stand before you with a message that must be heard. The necessity of our principles has been overlooked, ignored by a people who have grown complacent amidst comfort and luxury. History warns us of civilizations that fell prey to their own decadence. Babylon, once towering and wealthy, crumbled under the weight of its indulgences, an easy conquest of the Medes and Persians. Rome, mighty in arms, succumbed to the allure of bread and circuses, laid low by invaders. The Incas, advanced and prosperous, fell before a handful of conquerors armed with superior technology. Today, I speak not only of history, but of our present. America, once a beacon of strength and resilience, has become self-indulgent. We have prioritized comfort over fortitude while our global competitors seize leadership. Our resources are squandered abroad, our criminals coddled at home. The dangerous delusion that it can't happen here blinds us to our vulnerabilities. But I do not despair. In the midst of this crisis, I see opportunity. Our salvation lies in the hands of patriots, those with vision, courage, and a commitment to greatness. We stand at a crossroads where the forthcoming inauguration represents not just a transition of power, but a moment for decisive action. We must act now. We must reclaim our strength, revive our resilience, and reaffirm our commitment to the principles that made this nation great. The challenges before us are immense, but so too is our resolve. Let us rise to meet this moment with unity and determination. Together, we will forge a path forward. A path that leads America back to its rightful place as a beacon of freedom, strength, and prosperity. Around the table, heads nodded in agreement. Each man, influenced by wealth and power, pledged their unwavering support. The room buzzed with a shared sense of mission, a collective resolve to reclaim the nation's destiny. As the meeting drew to a close, the yacht continued its journey through the darkening sea, its wake a symbol of the turbulence that lay ahead. 
The stage was set for a bold and perilous gambit, one that would determine the future of America. The Admiral and his allies were prepared to risk everything, driven by a fervent belief that they alone could save the nation from its perilous course. So, I decided to use my new powers for the good of the community. But it didn't go exactly as planned. I approached various agencies, offering my abilities to help in any way possible. The community service workers, swamped with demands for jobs and food, didn't see how a guy with superhuman strength could fit into their plans. They brushed me off thinking I was either a freak or a fraud. Every now and then, I did find chances to use my strength in big ways, like lifting a truck off a trapped child and saving a life. Those moments were rare, though. And while people were impressed for a moment, it didn't lead to any lasting acceptance. Even the police, who I thought would be eager for my help in catching criminals, churned me away. They were set in their ways and suspicious of my unconventional approach but I didn't give up. I managed to get a meeting with the young governor of the state. He was polite and seemed interested, even respectful of my abilities. However, despite our cordial conversation, he couldn't offer much in terms of support or encouragement. It became clear that traditional avenues for contributing to society were closed to me. Just as I was beginning to feel the sting of rejection, an agent from the William Morris office who had been persistently trying to reach me finally caught my attention. He painted a dazzling picture of fame and fortune, explaining how my abilities could be monetized. Endorsement deals, poster rights, appearances at state fairs and on television, it could earn me all millions. Aunt May and Uncle Ben were wary of the commercial exploitation of my gifts, but against their advice, I reluctantly signed the contract. Almost overnight, I was thrust into the world of show business. The William Morris office rebranded me as Spider-Man. And suddenly, I was the darling of heiresses and the guest of honor at glamorous parties. My face was everywhere, on posters and commercials, promoting products that supposedly gave me my strength. I even devised a contraption that shot out latex webs from my wrists, allowing me to swing from building to building like Tarzan. Despite the wealth and attention, I was unhappy. The glitz and glamour felt hollow, far removed from my original desire to help others. The parties, the money, and the adulation from the beautiful people only deepened my sense of disillusionment. I longed to make a real difference find a way to use my powers for the greater good, rather than just for entertainment. One evening, as I prepared for an appearance on the Johnny Carson show, I looked out over the city I once hoped to protect. The latex webs I now use to swing from skyscrapers felt like a far cry from the heroic deeds I had envisioned. The realization that I had strayed from my path weighed heavily on me. The applause of the audience and the flashing cameras couldn't fill the void that grew within me. I knew I needed to find a way back to my true purpose, to become the hero I always wanted to be. But all of that was about to change.
the dead of night, a convoy of trucks rolled into an aerospace plant in Houston, Texas. Under the cover of darkness, armed men swiftly overpowered the guards at the gate and made their way to the loading ramp. Massive crates filled with mysterious cargo were waiting for them. The men loaded the crates into their trucks and disappeared into the night. As dawn broke over Cape Canaveral, Florida, the serene morning was shattered by a fiery collision. Two cars crashed, igniting a blaze that blocked the highway. As traffic piled up, a convoy of semis pulled over to assist. But it was a ruse. Armed men emerged from the wrecked cars and hijacked the semis, taking control of the valuable cargo they carried. Beneath Washington, D.C., in a secret spur of the subway, a clandestine lab buzzed with activity. The stolen cargo from the hijackings arrived, and a group of white-coated scientists eagerly awaited its delivery. The phone rang, and Admiral Williams's voice echoed through the lab, seeking confirmation. The reply was succinct. The H-bomb had arrived and was installed. As preparations for the inaugural parade were underway in Washington, D.C., excitement filled the air. People camped along the parade route, and media personalities like Barbara Walters and Art Buchwald mingled with the crowd, capturing the festive atmosphere. However, underground, a sinister plan was unfolding. In a hidden subway spur, workers in white coats meticulously arranged flowers around a massive object concealed beneath a garland-covered float. The parade commenced, with floats and marching bands making their way through the streets. As the garland-covered float approached the reviewing stand, a deafening roar pierced the air. The float transformed, revealing a 100-foot-tall robot. The garlands fell away like snowflakes as the robot stood tall, its immense frame casting a shadow over the crowd. With a flick of its wrist, the robot unleashed a torrent of fire, incinerating the platform and the dignitaries upon it, including the president, vice president, and many cabinet members and congressmen. Instantly, the world was thrown into chaos. Television coverage of the parade morphed into live broadcasts of destruction and death. The robot, towering above the city, trampled everything in its path. The ground shook as it marched towards its program targets, intent on eradicating every symbol of democratic governance. Panic ensued as people fled, but many were caught under the robot's massive feet. Meanwhile, across the nation, command posts were established in communications headquarters. Every network and teletype was hijacked to broadcast a remote message from the sea. Admiral Williams, calm and assured, addressed the nation. This nation is falling apart because of weak, spineless leaders. The government is in ruins, decimated by incompetence and corruption. And now, in this moment of crisis, we need strong leadership more than ever. I'm done watching our country be torn apart by fools who can't see beyond their own noses. We don't need more empty promises or half measures. We need real, decisive action. I promise to provide the strong leadership this country so desperately needs. It's time to stop the madness, restore order, and rebuild our nation with the strength and determination it deserves. Enough is enough. The Secretary of the Treasury, Ruth Taylor, the highest-ranking surviving official, assumed command of the shattered democracy. In the midst of the chaos, the loyal remnants of the military sought out Admiral Williams. His corvette, guarded by warships, was located off the East Coast. A loyal submarine commander launched Polaris missiles, sinking the vessel. However, Williams was not aboard. He appeared on television again. You think my 
predictions are extreme. Look around. This country is on the brink of collapse, and I'm doing what needs to be done for its ultimate survival. Weakness and indecision have brought us to this point, and I refuse to let it continue. If you oppose me, you're opposing the very survival of our nation. I won't hesitate to bring further destruction to those who stand in the way of our resurgence. This isn't a game. This is about saving our country from complete ruin. Stand with me or face the consequences. The time for talk is over. It's time for action. With Washington, D.C. facing annihilation, the government desperately sought a way to stop the robot. Bomb squads and green berets were brushed aside like flies. Then, someone remembered Spider-Man. Peter Parker, known as Spider-Man, was called upon for this seemingly impossible task. As I approached the colossal machine, its towering frame cast a long shadow over the city. I felt the weight of responsibility settle on my shoulders. This was it. No turning back now. Navigating its exterior with agility and precision, I used my spider-like abilities to cling to the metal surface as it moved. My heart pounded as I searched for a way in and finally spotted a small aperture just big enough for me to squeeze through. Entering the robot felt like diving into a mechanical bloodstream, wires and gears whirring around me like the pulse of a giant. The inside was an electronic labyrinth, glowing with the eerie light of circuits and screens. Unsure of where to go, I trusted my instincts, moving quickly and silently through the maze of machinery. Suddenly, I found it. The control center of the robot. Standing in the midst of the chaos was Admiral Williams, his eyes burning with fanaticism as he operated the controls. For a split second, I hesitated. This was the man responsible for all this destruction. The man who almost brought Washington to its knees. And now, it was up to me to stop him. After spotting Williams inside the robot, I quickly crawled out and began attacking it from the outside. I had been warned that the robot might be carrying a dangerous bomb, and I needed to stop it. The monumental struggle that followed tested me in ways I hadn't imagined. Williams controlled the might of the machine, while I relied on my strength, speed, and agility. The robot's arms swung at me with terrifying force, each blow capable of churning me into a smear on the metal floor. I dodged and weaved, using my spider sense to anticipate the attacks, but the odds were overwhelmingly against me. Washington's fate hung by a thread. Williams unleashed everything he had, the robot's limbs crashing down around me like a storm. I fought back with everything I had. I spotted the bomb, a massive, ticking monstrosity wired into the heart of the machine. If I didn't act fast, it was all over. I launched myself towards it, dodging another swipe from the robot's arm. and landed next to the bomb. My fingers flew as I worked to defuse it, my heart racing against the clock. The bomb deactivated with a soft beep and I allowed myself a brief moment of relief. But the fight wasn't over. With the bomb diffused, I turned my attention to disabling the robot. I had to think fast. 
the robot's massive form loomed over me, and I knew I had to get it away from the city. I knew I had to destroy this robot, and fast. Desperation washed over me as I racked my brain for a solution. Then, my eyes landed on my web shooters. At that moment, I realized that these latex webs were about to become much more than just a marketing stunt. I quickly fired the webs at the robot's legs, using all my strength and agility to control its movements and steer it towards the Potomac River. Williams, realizing what I was doing, fought back with renewed fury. The robot's movements became erratic, and I had to pull with everything I had to keep it on course. The massive machine stumbled towards the river, its footsteps shaking the ground. Finally, with a great shuddering groan, it toppled into the water. The Potomac River swallowed the robot, its menacing form disappearing beneath the waves. I narrowly escaped from the robot's outstretched hand, swinging away just in time. Emerging from the water, I was soaked and exhausted, but victorious. The capital, though, scarred by the day's events, I had saved the day, but I knew the world had changed. This is the conclusion to my story. My act of bravery had spread all over the country. And before I knew it, I was standing at the White House. In this huge ceremony, the new president, Ruth Taylor, personally gave me, Spider-Man, the nation's highest civilian honor. The applause and the cheers from everyone dignitaries, military officials, and civilians. It was, it was deafening. Washington, which had almost been destroyed, was safe again. Admiral William's coup had been stopped, and I was now seen as a new symbol of hope and resilience. Everyone looked at me with awe. The media followed my every move and word. But underneath the mask and all the praise, I was still just Peter Parker, a young guy struggling with loneliness. My public persona was celebrated and loved, but my private life felt like a heavy burden with my dual identity. I went to fancy galas and parties, mingling with cover girls and models. They were all fascinated with the mystery of Spider-Man, drawn to the allure of the superhero. But these interactions felt so empty. These conversations were shallow, and the connections were brief. I longed for something real, someone who could understand and accept the complexities of my life as Spider-Man. Back in my small apartment, reality hit hard. Aunt May and Uncle Ben, my rock, could sense my growing sadness. Despite the fame and fortune, my heart ached with loneliness. I had the admiration of the world, but I felt more isolated than ever. Nights were the toughest. The city skyline with all of its lights and tall buildings stretched out before me as I swung from building to building. 
the thrill of swinging through the air, which used to be exhilarating, now felt like a metaphor for my life. Always moving, but never really connected to anyone or anything. In the following weeks, I made some small but important changes. I signed up for evening classes at a local college, hoping to further my education and maybe meet some like-minded people. I reconnected with old friends, those who knew me as Peter Parker, not, not Spider-Man. Slowly, I started to find moments of normalcy in my extraordinary life. I began to learn that I had two lives to live. One as Spider-Man, but one as just Peter Parker. My journey remained challenging, filled with the complexities of living a dual life. But I wasn't alone anymore. With the nation's highest honor hanging on my wall and new friendships growing, I found a renewed sense of purpose. Swinging through the city at dawn still had its lonely moments, but there was a promise of companionship and understanding waiting for me at the end of each day. In the end, I discovered that being a hero wasn't just about saving lives, it was also about finding the courage to seek happiness in the midst of chaos. And as I swung into the rising sun, I knew that my journey, though full of challenges, held the promise of a brighter, more hopeful tomorrow.